Uh, I want to um, uh, welcome to the stage Dr. Thomas Pope. <coughs> Thomas, will you come and join me, please? Um, about 18 months ago, uh, a, a group of about 20 of us uh, went on a trip to Vienna. We always have a trip in the spring every year to different places, and uh, last year it was Vienna. Um, and one of the places we visited was Vienna University Observatory. And that's where we had the pleasure of uh, uh, meeting Thomas, because he's the senior scientist there, and he spent a long time um, uh, guiding us around the observatory, and then gave us a kind of impromptu talk about the value of darkness. And I and a few other people were so impressed by this impromptu talk that we said, Thomas, why don't you come over to our club in Cork and tell us about this at more length? And that's exactly what's going to happen tonight. Um, Thomas uh, also took the time to wheel his bicycle to a very nice restaurant for us as well. So we're extremely grateful um, for uh, his entertaining of us in uh, uh, Vienna, and we've been entertaining him over this weekend here in Cork. And now he's going to give us his lecture on night is more than the absence of light on the value of darkness. So please will you uh, welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Posch from Vienna. So while my computer is just starting, I'd like to thank you, Peter, for inviting and thank you for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've seen great places so far. And um, I hope that tonight's talk will be interesting for you. It's a topic that's really close to my heart. The value of darkness or protecting nightscapes. And um, this talk will be sort of a potpourri, to be honest. It will be a little bit of astronomy, a little bit of ecology. And also, in the second part, some quotations from philosophical uh, works, from uh, world religions, from uh, poets, because I think the topic of night is such a complex topic as the concept of light is as well, that we need to choose such an interdisciplinary approach in order to really appreciate night in all its respects. Of course, I cannot do this tonight, but I can try to get you interested in some of these aspects, which for me, since about 10 years, provide really a big source of inspiration and fascination. Uh, I'll also make a short advertisement for a book written by my biggest enemy, <laughs> <laughs> Paul Bogart. Uh, well, he's my enemy on only insofar as I co-edited the book with the same title in German, and he stole the title, but probably he didn't steal it, he just came up with it ind independently. And it's a totally different book. Mine is about more the science aspects of light pollution, and this is A Journey into Darkness by a writer, his associate professor of English language somewhere in America. Nevertheless, he writes good English. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so, to... To prove this, uh, to prove this, and to get you interested, I will start with the same quote with which he starts uh, the book, and then read something from the book, and then I'll proceed with my talk. So, the quotation at the beginning of, of his book is just very short. It's it's like this: "To go in the dark with, sorry, to go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To kn to know the dark, go dark, go without sight." and find that the dark too blooms and sings, and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. So, um, and this is to fo be followed now by a personal experience um, made by Paul Bogart when he was still young, and I just want to quote this as well, because I think it's really breathtaking, and a few of us will have made a similar experience. I also haven't, I must say. So he writes, The most beautiful starry sky I have ever seen was more than 20 years ago when I was backpacking through Europe as an 18-year-old high school graduate. I had traveled south from Spain into Morocco and from there south to the Atlas Mountains 
at the edge of the Sahara Desert to a place where nomadic tribes came in from the desert to barter and trade, a place that when I look up on the map, I can no longer find. One night in a youth hostel that was more like a stable, I woke and walked out into a snowstorm. But it wasn't the snow I was used to in Minnesota or anything else I had been. Standing bare chest to cool night, wearing flip-flops and shorts, I let a storm of stars swirl around me. I remember no light pollution. I remember no lights. But I remember the light around me, the sense of being lit by starlight. And that I could see the ground to which the stars seemed to be floating down. I saw the sky that night in three dimensions. The sky had depth some stars seemingly close and some much farther away. The Milky Way so well defined it had what astronomers call structure, that sense of its twisting depths. So much about this. <laughs> and as I said, hardly any experienced observer will have made similar experiences. And um, the reason for this, for this no longer seeing the stars in that way, is light pollution. Now, when we talk about light pollution, there is one big misconception, which is that um, light would be something evil or bad. No one would believe us. So uh, dark sky activists all around the world fight against the prejudice of being, you know, some obscure people fighting against light. So to make this very clear from the beginning on, um, I'm of the opinion that uh, daylight is something that we cannot get enough of. So the daylight, um, a, lot, a lot of light, especially sun-like light at the right time during daytime is something that we urgently need. And Khalil Gibran once wrote, the sun teaches us the longing for light, but at the same time he says, but it is night that raises us all towards the stars. And where we, you know, the feeling how it is like this picture has been taken um, three years ago. I was on Lastovo Island, which is in southern Croatia. It took me quite a while to get there. And the view of the Milky Way was just breathtaking because south of this island, there's just nothing, no lights, straight down to Egypt, hundreds of kilometers. But I'll come back to that particular place. Anyway. Um, as a scientist, I like to measure light and light pollution, different light levels. So don't be afraid, I won't show you a lot of measurements or scientific plots, but <coughs> this one is uh, something that I think is important to have in mind as a background. It is about, about different levels of brightness and levels of darkness. And one of my uh, messages actually tonight for you is there is no such thing as complete darkness. And this can be nicely seen on this graph. Is there a laser pointer somewhere, by the way? It's up there. This one? Okay. Yeah. So, have a look. This is just um, illuminance. Illuminance is the unit not so much used in astronomy, but in, in lighting technique. And a clear sunny day is characterized by about 100,000 lux. And of course, when the sun approaches the horizon and it sets, then we have much less. So still the sun being close to the horizon, still, still during daytime, it falls down from 100,000 to about 700 lux. It goes down rapidly during twilight, and illuminance reaches a value of about 1 millilux. So look how much powers of 10, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 powers of 10 between the illuminance of bright daylight and the illuminance provided just by starlight in a scene like this, where you would still be able to see the ground when you are dark adapted, to uh, maybe even uh, go, a go along a path where you have some obstacle and would perceive them just due to starlight. And uh, this is just because the human eye can bridge this whole span of orders of magnitudes of illuminance. And some animals can even go further. They can detect prey at 10 to the minus 4 lux. So a tenth of 
one millilux. And this is something that I find really interesting also because it is so recent knowledge. Uh, a few years ago, researchers were not at all interested in the ecology of the night. They were not at all interested in uh, measuring the light levels at which, um, say, frogs can catch their prey, salamanders come out, come out of their habitats, uh, um, bats emerge from church towers and so on. But this is now a um, topic of current research, and we know now that uh, at these light levels there is active nightlife in the forests going on. And uh, we, we know, of course, that humans are able to see uh, light of this very dim uh, intensity if they are dark adapted. Okay, so much for this. Well, one thing I have to add, the full moon is several orders of magnitude above this level. It's about 300 millilux if it's in the zenith, or 0.3 lux. Uh, but street lighting is orders of magnitude beyond that. At least the street, level that, street lighting that we have nowadays. It was not always like this. So this is really something that worries me a lot uh, because we have to ask the question, is, is this really adequate? Do we need it? I also measure uh, such illuminances. Everybody of you can do it. There is since about, say, five or seven years an um, instrument on the market. It costs just about 120 euros. It's called the SQM, Sky Quality Meter. Some of you may have such a thing. It's just a device the size of a mobile phone. And it would measure sky brightnesses if you want all night long. Bad weather is no obstacle to this kind of astronomical observations because it's also interesting to measure the night sky brightness when the sky is cloudy, to know how the clouds sort of amplify the scattering of light and sort of amplify light pollution. It is also a scientific result to know how bright the city sky is when it's cloudy, because most nights in Europe are cloudy. And so we, we need to know to which uh, light pollution we are um, exposed in that case. So just go out and buy an SQM. It's a very, very, really interesting instrument. Um, the Light pollution, of course, is frequently depicted by satellite images. In this case, it's an ISS picture of Vienna, where some of you have been. And uh, not all the cities around the world are in the situation of having some mountains around. Vienna has mountains to the west and to the north, which means that there is a natural barrier to this um, ubiquitous phenomenon of cities spreading and their streetlights ever spreading to all directions. But nevertheless, there are a couple of regions of Vienna where you have no such barriers and where you have light pollution just spreading, uh, as it seems, infinitely. And this can also be seen in this picture where you have Vienna and Bratislava. Um, the probably two closest capitals in Europe, it's just 70 kilometers. And the problem is that the sky um, glow or the light domes of these two cities are gradually <coughs> growing together. And even though you would think that there are a lot of dark places in the between still, or north of Bratislava or west of Vienna, it's clear that the regions that appear black on this map, they are not characterized by the absence of light pollution. You all know that uh, these sky glow phenomena, they have a really wide range of, um, how should I say, they, they radiate far into the environment and even at distances larger than 100 kilometers, uh, the sky glow of a large city can be seen. It's fortunately not the case for most Irish cities, I guess. Uh, first, because they, they are not so overlit as other cities. And, and second, because um, the, the most Irish cities are not so big. But if, if you take a city like uh, Cape Town in South Africa, that was really a shocking example and shocking experience to me. I went to Cape Town and I went to an observatory where they have the South African Large Telescope. 
that's about 300 kilometers away from Cape Town, and I was still able to see the uh, light dome of that city at the distance of 300 kilometers. So this, once you make such a shocking experience, you just wake up and sort of think uh, there must something be done about this because surely nobody in Cape Town would profit from the fact that the light is propagating 300 kilometers th through the atmosphere. And uh, by simple ways of shielding lamps, you can easily avoid this, at least to some extent. Looking at Europe from the satellite uh, provides such an image. You probably all know examples. And, um, well, what is this here at the uh, bottom right? I found an interesting uh, paper from 1997 by an English economist who studied the price of light uh, as it developed from, what is it here, 1880 to, 19, or to even 2000, so the past um, 120 years, excluding the 21st century. And what he found out is that light got cheaper by four orders of magnitude. He expressed the price of light in terms of how long does a worker have to work to pay for a candle, for example. And if you express the price of light that way, you find out that uh, the time you needed to work for a certain amount of lights to be produced was reduced by 10 to the 4, which is by 10,000 within these 120 years. And this leads me to the picture that we have all this light pollution mostly for one reason, not because we need these lights, not because it's so extremely comfortable, but rather because light is just for free, basically. It's like a plastic bag that uh, in every supermarket uh, you would be thrown after. So you would get it for free, and what is for free is not appreciated, and what is for free is used just overabundantly. Much the same problem with petrol, much the same problem with other things that pollute our environment. But for light, it's not so well known, I would say. Um, so all this light waste is at least to a large extent due to the fact that light is so cheap. And it's also interesting to ask the question whether some countries like Northern Italy, for example, or Bel Belgium, Netherlands, um, or, yeah, also the coast regions here, Southern Spain, Portugal, uh, are they more densely populated? I don't think so. That uh, Of course, this plain here in northern Italy is very densely populated, but not proportionally uh, to the way in which it is more brightly lit than, say, northern Germany or Denmark or southern Sweden. Yes, of course, there's a gradient in density of the population, but the density in lighting is much stronger, and so there must be something, a cultural thing. You will be more interested in this part of the world, of course. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, just another thing to remind you of, this is uh, just two pictures taken with the same lens, same exposure time, same sensitivity, um, always same camera data. This is the moon close to full moon and that's a modern street light in Toulouse, southern France. And these three letters, L, E, D, <coughs> provide a real threat at the moment, even though this technology of, it's also called solid state lighting, uh, could also be used for uh, reasonable lighting. It is a kind of light that can be easily dimmed and where you can almost freely choose the, the color temperature of the light. Uh, but usually the installations are done in a way as to maximize the light output and um, as to have the best so-called efficiency, so the, the highest lumen per watt output, which uh, in many cases means that phenomena like uh, glare and so on are not really considered and you have really too bright and too glary lamps. So uh, my my idea is that we are now facing a, 
another revolution in lighting technology. We had already some, for example, from the gas to the electrical lighting, or from the um, incandescent lamps to the discharge lamps. Now we are just in the middle of the LED revolution. If you carefully look, watch out here in Cork, you would also see some replacing the old uh, high pressure sodium ones, so the more yellowish lights being replaced by, as far as I could see, this type of LEDs. But it's not a law of nature, of course, that LEDs have to be that way. They can be made each color, each kind of intensity, and so on, but it's just one standard type that is most frequently sold, and it's usually not the best one, unfortunately. So, um, another point about light at night is that a lot of it is used for decoration, for festivals, so not at all for security lights, for orientation, for street lighting, things like these, festivals of light, uh, just a side note, the footnote is that the Eiffel Tower in Paris was originally designed, or an other project instead of the Eiffel Tower would have been to have a huge tower of light illuminating this, the whole center of Paris. This has not been made actually, uh, but nevertheless, the Eiffel Tower in Paris is also connected to light festivals and it ha also has a kind of a light beam installed on top since a couple of years. Now, uh, let's take a look at Ireland. I'm, I'm indebted to a colleague from Trinity College in Dublin for these figures. He just provided them to me a few days ago. And what you can see in the top figure is the light output of the Republic of Ireland as measured from satellite data from 1994 to 2014. Uh, the development of the cross-national product uh, where you can see this uh, <coughs> strong economic growth, the crisis in, in around 2009. Um, but you can also see that light output, so the growth of light output and the growth of um, the gross national product are not strictly correlated. <laughs> if it were so, that would be bad news, of course, because that would mean that light pollution is just of a natural byproduct of economic growth, and we are all pretty much in favor of economic growth, I guess. But it is not the case that you can just say where you have better economy of more lights. Um, consider Northern Ireland. I don't think that Northern Ireland would have had a strong recession in those years, so they probably also experienced some maybe more moderate economic growth, and the, the, the light output of, of Northern Ireland was kept fairly constant. The good news <coughs> is that um, also in the Republic of Ireland, in the very last years, there seems to be a stagnation in the light output as measured from satellite <coughs> data, even though it's quite tricky to really measure this because there are sometimes saturation effects in the satellite data, so it's really hard to get good data on this. But if these data are correct, then we can say that hopefully there is some peak reached already in the light output of this country towards space. And uh, uh, there could be already a reverse of the trend of wasting light into space. Let's hope so. Would be another argument for getting active at this moment and, and try to really uh, unite forces in order to minimize uh, light pollution. If we do not do anything about it, uh, it, it could also happen what uh, has been predicted for the US and has partly been measured also. Uh, here the colors do not have any physical meaning in the sense of blue or green or red light. It's just so-called false colors. Black is really black skies and the different colors mean different intensities with um, I think the greenish parts still being those from which you could see the Milky Way and the yellowish and orange parts uh, being those where you could see only a very strongly reduced number of stars and of course the orange and red and even white parts are the brightest cities and you can see how light spreads according to these projections still between 19... 97 and uh, 2025. We are fairly close to this even now. So um, 
this is really a threat, I would say. And um, I like to take fi fisheye <coughs> pictures of the night sky because they are really interesting in, in the sense that you can see these light domes even if they are very far away. I mentioned the example of uh, Cape Town previously. Uh, this is again from Lastovo Island in southern Croatia. And here what amazed me was that Lastovo Island is close to the Croatian coast, but you have the other side of the coast and there's Italy and that's about 100 kilometers away. And what you see here is nothing else than light domes from uh, southern Italy. There again, uh, like in Ireland, no really big cities. Uh, and still, and still, um, there is a fairly big light pollution from uh, southern Italy being visible at the Croatian coast, or close to the Croatian coast. And of course, a city sky like this one, I think I took this in Vienna, uh, is characterized by the complete washing out of any contrast. And in, so the, <coughs> even the brighter stars not being visible, the Milky Way not being visible. So this is the situation as we have it now. And um, even in very remote areas, this is taken in the Italian Alps, you can see again that sky glow is affecting the quality of the night sky. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is probably from the <coughs> cities like Milan, which are more than 100 kilometers away from this place where I took this picture. Now, uh, a nice metaphor that came into my mind when I was in the Alps is the following one. Um, people really love untouched nature. And everyone of us from time to time wants to go and see a landscape where humans have not really <coughs> left major traces, not, uh, have, have not destroyed the landscape. And so uh, a fresh river or brook like this one may be a symbol of untouched nature. And, and my idea is that everyone would have not a very hard time to reach a point in nature which is untouched in the sense of the uh, perception of landscape during daytime. So you would find fresh water, um, nice vegetation whatsoever, not heavy air pollution. So to travel from Cork to a place in Ireland that looks untouched by the standards of daytime ecology would not be a very <coughs> difficult task. Uh, while if you were, and this is why I produced this overlay here, if you would find a brownish river like this, even in remote places, you would of course be alarmed. But this is exactly the situation with the night sky, because this, for example, is a picture taken at a quite remote place in Switzerland, 2,500 meters above sea level. Um, and even with the fog being here above uh, St. Moritz and other places in the famous Engadin, uh, you can see the light <coughs> shining up. So the point of, of, of this comparison, so in principle this picture, this metaphor with the water, and also this picture here is to show that while uh, landscapes as we per, uh, perceive them during daytime may seem untouched by standards of, of daytime ecology and they are really, uh, they do provide fresh air, fresh water, uh, the, the degradation of the night skies is much worse. This is what I want to show you. But there is hope. No? <laughs> So um, maybe some of you can come up with uh, some very successful company developing or growing such plants. I took these big pictures also in, in alpine landscapes. Anyway, would be you know it always takes time for these to grow, and before this grows so high up, uh, probably the next generation of bright LEDs would uh, replace the previous ones. <coughs> Just to mention it briefly, um, when, when we talk about night and the value of night, the value of darkness, um, we shouldn't be anthropocentric too much <coughs> because 
there are a lot of creatures out there which urgently need darkness. If they don't get the d darkness that they are used to, now I'm talking about nocturnally active animals, such as moths, for example, uh, then they would be disturbed so much that they fly towards the light and just forget about anything else, like nutrition or reproduction and so on. And so it is estimated that hundreds of billions of moths are attracted and killed by streetlights every year in countries like uh, Germany or any other European country. Bats are another example. I learned from John that they are not very much respected in the general public. I don't know why. Or, I mean, it could be that they are frightening. Uh, and, and also, Paul Bogart, in his book, he has a few pages on, on bats, and he admits that it's hard to convince people to laugh, that they should laugh bats. Uh, but interestingly, they have a large value also for pollination and for for agriculture in general, it has been even figured out that I think they are worth three billion dollars for <coughs> US American agriculture in the sense of that you do not need insecticides when you have beds and so on. So these are just two examples. I could give a separate talk just about <coughs> animals and light pollution. And when I'm uh, attending conferences about this topic every now and then, I'm really surprised about the additional knowledge that comes up every six months or so with new research results about other species that have not been thought of so far which are also affected by light at night. So I leave it at these two examples because this would lead into a different discussion otherwise. <coughs> what I cannot uh, leave unmentioned however is light and health or rather darkness and health and here we are probably at the core of the question, what is the value of darkness? Because the value of darkness for the general uh, public would probably not be, yes, I can see the stars so nicely, uh, because I don't have to convince you, but uh, the ordinary people out there would say, who cares if I can see uh, the stars due to darkness? But there is something about darkness that is really relevant to everybody no matter if he or she is interested in astronomy or not at all. And that's um, circadian disruption. Now, what is circadian disruption? Humans are a diurnal species, so we are day active by our very nature. So prior to the invention of uh, the electric bulb, we, we were in fact very attached, or our activity was all centered to the time between sunrise and sunset. This has changed, of course, but nevertheless, we usually go to sleep at some point, say at uh, 11 p.m. or so, or at midnight. And the question is then, uh, is our body exposed to light, either prior to going to bed or even after going to bed? This lady here, she is uh, not in her own bed, as you see, but there's some cables around, so she's in a so-called sleeping laboratory. And that's another hot topic of current research. And just these days while I'm, while I'm here, uh, sorry, I just wanted to, to stay with this slide uh, for one more minute. Just while I'm here, a heated discussion is going on about whether it is true, as it has been claimed in 2007, that uh, the shift workers who are exposed to light at night have an increased uh, risk of uh, breast cancer and uh, prostate cancer. And it, it seems so. So a lot of evidence points into that direction. The reason being that um, when we get tired, um, melatonin is expressed. This is a hormone in our body. And melatonin is a hormone that is extremely important for our Im immune system. So if we see light, if we would sleep under these conditions as they are in this room, for example, with relatively bright and especially white, so-called cold white light, which is light that has a blue component, this is also why I have put this bluish picture here, this bluish light, then melatonin, which would naturally be expressed in our bodies during the late evening hours and especially between midnight and six o'clock in the morning, 
would not be expressed. So this so-called uh, sleep hormone is lacking then. And this is, uh, means, in, in, in other words, that this uh, very important support of our immune system is lacking. And the, the hypothesis is that this uh, leads to an increased risk in, risk in breast cancer. Um, of course, the debate is going on, but uh, the link between light at night and lack of melatonin is quite firmly established. So you see that in rats, you see that in, in, in humans, in, in monkeys, you see that in a whole set of species, actually m most species on planet Earth, show this connection of having a lack of melatonin, the so-called dark hormone, but it's a good hormone actually, um, when they are exposed to light at night. Whether or not or to which extent this even leads to an increased risk of certain uh, cancers is still a matter of debate, as I just mentioned. <coughs> so um, astronomers and also other scientists think a lot in terms of light spectra. You know, if you take the visible spectra, the vi visible colors, and um, uh, think of them as wavelengths, like blue light being centered <coughs> towards 450 nanometers, green light at 500, reddish light towards 600, then this is not sunlight and that's not moonlight, but it's just the sensitivity of the human eye during daylight, this is why I put the sun symbol here, the sensitivity of the human eye during night, also during astronomical observing, by the way. <laughs> and this is, with this ZZZ symbol, uh, at least in Austria people make this when they sleep, I don't know how, how you do in <laughs> Ireland. But, they like uh, cartoons. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this is the, the, the part of the spectrum which is not good but bad for sleeping. So actually I should have put a, a symbol <coughs> with the bed and, and uh, a cross through it so that it, it, it shows that you cannot sleep well, especially when we, you are exposed to light of this color. Now you, you, you might say, who the hell is so crazy as to turn on blue light at night? But it's not so far-fetched, because if you look at the display of a smartphone, for example, or any computer display, many TV displays, and also many kinds of street lights that you would see out before you go to bed, when you just come home from a pub, there would almost certainly be a huge contribution of these colors of light in many types of artificial light. And that would suppress then the melatonin that you need for healthy sleep. So this is why I put this sentence here, especially light with the spectrum here, should be avoided at night and during late evening hours. And I think that um, amateur astronomers could play a strong role in uh, thinking about this and even measuring this because some, many of us have sorts of spectrographs, like it could be even a simple um, prisma or a simple um, grating where, where we can analyze light can be done even with a CD-ROM to, you know, uh, this to, to, to <coughs> analyze light in terms of its spectral lines. And uh, so we are at least familiar in principle with the con concept of a spectrum and can contribute to the discussion which sorts of spectra do we really want for artificial light? Because there's in, in the general public and also in politics are just huge misconceptions about this. Okay, this is my final slide on this technical part. It just wants, this uh, is just supposed to show you that light at night is not per se a bad thing. There are a lot of lights out there that I think are properly done. This is an example also from northern Italy, even though I think there's a lot of bad light and too much light in general in northern Italy. But this is an example um, of a railway station lit in a way as not to produce glare with warm light, white, even orange light and with not too much intensity. So that would of course be beneficial. I took it actually out from a hotel window. So uh, it is very relevant which kind of light you get close to um, apartments, close to hotels, close to um, 
where people are living, where animals are living. This is also why coastlines are very relevant because you have a, a huge accumulation usually of uh, biodiversity near rivers, near, uh, near the sea and so on. So one should especially care about light, not only close to hotels as, as in this, this case, but also close to uh, rivers and close to the sea. Now from the technical to, I would say, spiritual aspects of night and darkness, because when I prepared this talk about the value of darkness, I thought I should come up with uh, some additional things that go beyond astronomy. And um, so here you will find one quote after the other. I hope it won't be too boring. Uh, actually, some of those are really nice, I think. This one is by... Uh, a, a Georgian writer, Ota Chilanz, I didn't know him before, but I like <coughs> this sentence very much. He says, the one who wants to see, he should sit in the dark. Sitting in the dark, you see your surroundings, while sitting in the light, you don't. Another really nice quote by uh, Nietzsche is, is this one. Tis night, now do all gushing fountains speak louder, and my soul too is a gushing fountain. So this uh, second quote is, is kind of uh, conveying the idea that uh, darkness or night is a period that enhances or may enhance creativity and may um, sort of be a favorable time for inwardness, for rest, for, for introspection, things like that. A lot, lot of philosophers and poets, uh, interestingly, uh, said similar things as Nietzsche did in this uh, quote from Thus spoke Zarathustra. <coughs> then there is another point that I'm uh, thinking of frequently, that uh, in the religions there is on the one hand kind of uh, appreciation of light, of course, uh, but on the other hand also an appreciation of night, such that God uh, reveals himself to humans during the night. Maybe in dreams, but maybe not only in dreams, uh, also in the early church there's this idea of uh, Christ coming um, at night, uh, but this is not only the case in Christianity, also in Buddhism, uh, Buddha is enlightened, sorry for the typo here, is enlightened at night time, <coughs> and the same is true for Mohammed, uh, who is enlightened uh, during night time. So I would say that night and light are sort of ambivalent in, in the world religions uh, simply because, I will skip this for a moment, uh, we have on the one hand side the um, darkness as a symbol of the evil. Uh, this, this can be found in a quote like this, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the <coughs> armor of light. Or another quote from the Gospel of uh, John, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. So uh, I think this is not just uh, quotes, this is something that is deeply rooted in us and when we are talking about light pollution we, we have to face the cultural background uh, that Light is generally considered as something that is a symbol of morally good, also in many films, also even in Star Wars you have you know, Darth Vader as the black guy. So uh, in, many, in many cases you have darkness or even black color as a symbol of morally inferior persons or actions and light as being the symbol of, of, of uh, morally superior. But on the other hand, um, if you take a closer look at the Bible, you would find a huge respect, not for darkness itself, and also not for light itself, but for this cycle of light and darkness. And this is, I think, what we should really go for and what is missing in our society, this appreciation of both light and darkness in the right, so to speak, right, and whatever is, is right, I mean, you can, of course, discuss about the time when to switch off lights or to reduce lights, but some uh, human rhythm, some rhythm that is uh, well uh, 
and designed to fit humans and not just to illuminate them 24 hours a day and seven hours a week. And uh, that is uh, an idea that you would really find in, in, in the world religions that there is a respect for the natural cycle of day and night. I, I particularly like this quote from Isaiah, which has another sense, I would admit it's more in an ethical sense, but uh, one could even take it as a motto for a dark sky movement, woe unto them that put darkness for light and light for darkness, because it's exactly what we are doing. We are living during daytime in closed rooms. Studies say that uh, we pass about 90% of our time in closed rooms during daytime, so we have too little light during daytime. We take uh, day for night, so to we tur turn uh, day into night during uh, working hours, and at the same time we have too much light at night, almost anywhere. Um, let me just comment this picture, uh, because it cost me quite a lot of work to do it. It was also taken on Lastovo Island, and even now that the lights are on in the room, you would maybe see here uh, that the Milky Way causes a reflection here in the Adriatic Sea, and it could be even spotted by the eye, if you would look carefully. And so this was really one of the rare occasions that came close to the quote that I read in the beginning with the three-dimensional impression. Right out, Thomas, so yeah, we'll let's try. That. Let's give it a try. Because I'm sure you would then see this more clearly here. Can you? Yeah. And at the horizon again, it, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a straight line here because it's a fisheye lens. But at the horizon again, you would see uh, basically Brindisi, which is at the other side of the Adriatic Sea. I wonder whether you will see one day from Western Ireland the uh, sky glow from New York, but probably <laughs> it's not possible due to the curvature of the Earth. But anyway, here it is possible. And uh, this is just a line produced by a ship passing by. But one of the most beautiful starry skies I've ever seen. And um, if you want to go for a place where the weather statistics is really good and where you would really um, also see lovely places around, I, can, I think we can turn back the line if you want. I can really recommend this island, Lastovo. Okay, so how should I proceed? Um, yeah, just with some quotes. How, how am I doing with time? I think I should spend not more than oh. 10 minutes or so. I would say another five minutes. Okay. Maybe another 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. <coughs> so that, then I, I will try to avoid overloading you with too many quotes. Um, just a few of them. Um, so what's the point? The point is that night is not just about starlight, even though starlight may be closest to our hearts, but uh, there is also such a thing as nightscapes. Nightscapes, no matter whether they are starlit, moonlit, and even cloudy. This is an example of uh, a relatively poor starry sky because the moon was up, as you can see here, the rocks being illuminated by the moon. And it just reminded me of this quote by Eichendorf, the whole landscape was like silvered by moonlight. So even though it's at the expense of the starry sky, <laughs> because you won't see it that well, but nevertheless, my idea is that nightscapes can be beautiful also if, if the sky is not perfectly dark, but if it's still a natural setting. And um, so it has been found out that this same poet has the following favorite words. It's somehow interesting because some of them are so far from our feeling now. It's not only night, so these are his favorite words. Night, forest, dark, quiet, beautiful and anguish. Uh, well, there are some that are still uh, present in our age, like anguish is always present, probably be the beautiful is always a topic, but uh, these four words, they are, so to speak, together uh, endangered 
the quiet. Think of the correlation between noise and light, so we, we don't suffer only from too much light, but also from too much noise. And uh, sometimes I'd li really like to travel back in time to this epoch when, when uh, not only these words played a huge role in, in poems, but also the corresponding things were still abundantly present. And uh, maybe my Favorite, uh, my favorite verses from uh, Romanticism, from a, poet of, a po poem of this era, are by Eduard Mörike. I tried to translate it. I won't read it in German. I just uh, tried to read my, uh, maybe wrong, but uh, <laughs> my English uh, translation. <coughs> so it, it goes this way. Be extinguished, day. Let me recover during night. While you, gentle star, chill me divinely, let me descend to the abyss of contemplation. Now this is maybe uh, really beyond uh, our uh, current feelings or so, but I think even with the knowledge that we have now about the process of recovery, uh, the process of uh, what is going on at our body when it's getting dark, all these even cellular repair mechanisms, I think there is a deep truth to these verses. Thomas, before you leave that slide, why don't you read it to us in German? Okay, <laughs> I thought, I, I planned so, but not just in a matter of time, but okay, this will cost just 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe some pains to you, because the German language is sort of painful sometimes. Okay. Lisch aus, o Tag, lass mich in Nacht genesen, in des ihr sanften Sterne göttlich kühlet, will ich zum Abgrund der Betrachtung steigen. Okay, I take this as a signal that I should uh, come to my conclusions. <laughs> And really, I'm, I'm almost done. I won't comment these pictures. You might be sad, but we can discuss this afterwards. Um, Yeah, just to mention, night is also a topic of many beautiful paintings of this epoch. I will have to skip this one, you probably know it, Van Gogh. This is particularly interesting because there is a village, probably in the morning hours, if I look at the moon here, with almost no street lights. Just some lights, maybe of the windows. And this is really remarkable because it's, it's something that cannot, can hardly be observed these days anymore. Okay, I, I just go quickly through this. And this is my second last slide, a call for action, so to speak. If you think you want to do something about it, I heard there will be another talk uh, in the Cork Astronomy Club later this year or next year uh, about light pollution. There are people in Ireland who, <coughs> who, so to speak, wait for you to get involved. There's the International, International Dark Sky Association, which you probably know, with a lot of material, not in German, but <coughs> even in English, American English, never, never mind. <laughs> And um, so have a look at these. And again, a short advertisement for my enemy. It's really worth reading. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was the most impressive lecture, Thomas. Thank you. Now, who's going to ask those some questions? Um, is there any uh, evidence uh, that um, the International Astronomical Associations or any of the national astronomical associations are putting pressure on governments or the EU to try and rectify the problem of light pollution? Well, um, I have a friend in the UK who keeps telling me 
the biggest problem in uh, light pollution activism is the apathy of astronomers. And he sometimes even includes amateur astronomers, even though amateur astronomers tend to be more active. But professional astronomers, because you were asking about the International Astronomical Union, I think, they are even less important players in this respect, I would say. There have been some contacts between a subgroup of the IAU, so there's a commission of the IAU dealing with site protection and with measuring light pollution and so on, and there have been some contacts between that subgroup of the IAU and uh, the International Association of Lighting Engineers, it's called the CIE, it's actually a French acronym for Commission Internationale d'Eclairage. Uh, so these two societies somehow <coughs> interact with each other and sometimes uh, respective directors love each other and sometimes they hate each other, so it always depends on the persons of course. But even when there were uh, more intense contacts at some points when new documents were prepared for example by the CIE on obtrusive lighting or however they call it, it was just like in a discussion club, it was not really a, strange, uh, a strong pressure because you mentioned putting pressure and so on. So I perceive a lot more pressure being exerted on a local level. This is why I'm here uh, locally and not you know, at the IAU headquarters or somewhere <laughs> because my experience is that if you have local um, contacts between amateur astronomers or ecologists, sleep researchers, um, and the respective lighting designers of a city council, that's much more effective. So this is my perception at least. On the other hand, we will have other, more uh, you know, assemblies of the IAU and I, I will try to push the topic there, others will try to, but I, I didn't see so much progress <coughs> in, at that level so far. When you showed this round your, your observatory, Thomas, in Vienna, <laughs> You showed us a blank wall and you said there's an office behind there now and there's people reading out printouts of data. But in the 19th century, when, this, when the observatory was built, there was a slot there where you would have a telescope there. You said there's no telescope now, it's just an office and that's what the professional astronomers do. Mm -hmm. They look at computer screens all day. Yes, yes. That's a, this is also why I was impressed today by the Crawford Observatory, because you st here still have the possibility to see this original setting of the meridian circle and the slit opening. We had the same instrument in Vienna. Most traditional observatories had it because it was used for timekeeping, for measuring the time, also for measuring coordinates and so on, but that has been largely abandoned. So Can I just explain for those of you, um, most of you probably know, but right at the side of this window, is the Crawford Observatory, which Thomas is talking about, and uh, uh, it, it was built in the, was it the 1840s, was it? 1846. Yeah, but Sorry, they, I just wanted to yeah. explain. That. Yeah, and there you have this meridian circle in one room, to, at the side of the main dome. And uh, of course, at the time when astronomers were still doing such things as timekeeping, or visually observing, visually discovering comets, discovering minor planets whatsoever. Uh, the, the motivation for them to get involved in, in sort of activism against light pollution was much stronger. And there are documents from that time when astronomers wrote about light pollution. Uh, still there are some, but uh, I would not overestimate the role of professional astronomers in dealing with light pollution. It's, it's a sad fact, but it is the case. There's a couple of questions about the right at the very back of the first and then down here. Okay. Is there also some investigation about global heating and light and light? Because light also produces heat and we're all in this massive global heating thing. So is there a connection? Is there something? There is, there is, but there's not much research on that. I've seen maybe one paper on that. Um, and the conclusions were not very clear, but in principle the, there is an effect of, of that sort and it always depends on the kind of lighting that you have. 
the LEDs that you currently have, some of them produce quite a lot of heat actually, even though, if, even though they are not supposed to. But if you want to have really bright LED lighting, the kind of brightness that uh, is typical for suburban routes, then these ones produce quite a lot of heat. They even need some cooling. So yes, there is an influence. And, and just the power consumption, I mean, we, we can say so much that about 10% of the electricity worldwide goes not to street lighting, but to lighting in total. Street lighting is much less than that. It's about 2 to 3%. But lighting in total uh, costs 10% of the energy that we use, 10% of the electricity, to be more precise, that we use worldwide. And again, even 10% may not sound as if it were a large number. But the point is that within these 10%, you could easily do a reduction of half of it. So you could get down from 10% to 5%. This is why the European Union has decided to ban the incandescent lamps. Because they thought that if we ban the incandescent lamp and replace them at the homes, you know, by the so-called energy-saving lamps, then we can immediately save a lot of energy. Which, however, was maybe not so well uh, thought to the end, so to speak, because the heating that you have inside a building, uh, it has been found out later that if you replace an incandescent lamp by an energy-saving lamp, it's often a cold white lamp, which gives a cold feeling in the room. So you have both less heating by the incandescent lamp, you, you turn up your heating to a higher degree, and you feel colder. <laughs> so the, it, you can consume maybe even more energy. So it's not always easy to get rid of the heat that is a byproduct of lamps. But sometimes it would be fairly easy, and in total you could save a lot of energy within these 10% of electricity consumed for lighting. Well, I know that in the Netherlands it's one big topic, the lighting, especially the street lighting, the incumbent and the highways and everything. So for years there were a lot of people trying to motivate <coughs> by local governments to put up the light, and they didn't. And then one smart person said, like, hey, but you save a lot of energy if you put on the street lights, like on highways and that kind of things. So that's what and a lot of places in the Netherlands is now happening and on highways that they just shut down the night at night mm -hmm. and save money. With the economical crisis, it's the perfect motivation for uh, the yeah. people of the government to get them going because like, the street light is paid by government. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So it's, in, um, it's really a good point, but if, because I was mentioning that light is so cheap, but on the other hand, among those expenses that are to be paid by um, communities, it's sometimes quite a high fraction of the budget, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. And it's a very un inefficient source of, of, of spending money, or a very useless spending money, because it's not proven that light at night increases the safety on roads, especially on motorways. There are even studies saying the contrary, that people drive in a more risky way when it's brightly lit. So it, there's no proof of lighting increasing uh, road safety. And uh, I also know of examples, not only in the Netherlands, but also in France, where uh, one highway leading all the way around Paris is no longer lit, because they found out that it has no negative consequences if it's not lit. So I think such examples should simply be collected and uh, that collecting such examples would gradually help to build up pressure on communities to think twice which kind of lighting is needed. But again, the danger for us is to be considered as those who want complete darkness, but that's not true. It's just a really modest idea, but justified idea, of having the right amount of light uh, where we need it and when we need it, not more than that. It's really, what could you, how could you be more modest than, than demanding that? I'll, I'll come to you in a minute, Paddy. There was another question somewhere in... No? Okay, Paddy, yeah. It's just that it cost me that most of the room is due to the action. Yeah, this is. The bright surfaces. I mean, we showed one the other station where we go, and this is 
the reddish light, but the radio station was red. That's why it's a reddish light. There was actually a white light shining on, on red. So it wasn't so the 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 pollution was produced at the not that of the light because it was a shining on. Yeah, so you mean that a lot of light pollution is just caused by reflection and, and uh, by scattering of light? I mean, it's all complicated, all the light is 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 complicated. Yeah, <coughs> this, this is often the case that light pollution results from poorly directed light, actually. What's another cut? John, you got a question? Just one quick question. You, you've been here a couple of nights, um, Thomas. What do you think of the light in the cork? Um, I see a lot of high pressure sodium lights here still, which is good in principle. It's good for several reasons. Uh, yellowish light attracts insects much less than whitish lights. Uh, yellowish light is less scattered in the atmosphere. This is why the sky is blue usually, because the short wavelength part is more scattered. And uh, these high pressure sodium lights that I can even see out uh, through these windows, uh, they are concerning the color temperature, concerning the intensity. I think uh, cork is, is quite nicely lit, but I see the danger that we discovered also yesterday night, I think that these could be gradually replaced with high pressure, no, not with high pressure sodium, but with uh, high color <laughs> temperature LEDs. Sorry, I'll just go back to this example to recall it. So this again is a high pressure sodium light up to the top left. And here, this here to the right is, a high, is an LED with a high color temperature, whitish light. That's what does appear to be happening at the moment. A lot of this, when the sodium rates are breaking, yes. they seem to be putting in these ones. And lighting engineers keep telling me that it is very easy to equip these kinds of lights with a timing scheme, which means that you just reduce the intensity by 50%, even by 80% in the second half of the night or after 11 p.m. And this was not so easy for the sodium, so for the high pressure sodium lamps. So a good lighting plan for the city of Cork would be to maybe, yes, redu uh, replace the high pressure sodium lamps with such ones, but only under the condition that the intensity is chosen uh, in an appropriate way, that uh, a scheme is applied where you reduce the intensity in the course of the night. Many cities are doing that, and again, there is no argument for one city doing it and the other not doing it. Every city that does not use the potential of these LEDs to be dimmed down is just wasting energy. Was there a question down? Did I see someone's hand on here? <coughs> I'm afraid we're not going to get all the questions in, but there's a fellow in a striped shirt up there. That's yourself, yes. <laughs> It's too far fetched to imagine that um, light photons, the wave pattern of light photons from, we say, light source A can be cancelled by equal and opposite light photon waves from source B. Or is that too wacky? Um, I wouldn't know of any practical solution to do so. Uh, yeah, in principle, this effect can be used in physics on a micro scale or on, under certain conditions. But it's a question of coherence of rays, and usually it's not feasible. But I would be the first to invent such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Was there someone in there? Paul? Yeah. Gentlemen back, yeah. Um, so two quick things. The first thing is that another advantage of getting control of light pollution is from the tourist point of view. And, uh, in Kerry, and I think in Mayo now, they have these dark sky areas that they're trying to use to enhance tourism locally. And it's something that has worked very well in other countries, such as New Zealand. Um, so that's a, that's a positive, and a positive of it. And then, uh, more generally, just from the point of view of raising local public awareness, addressing this to Peter and company, is that something that the club could get involved in? 
Could the club get together and um, maybe meet up with people in the, the city council or the county council as concerns <coughs> about light pollution? Maybe with a bit of support from other individuals in UCC. Um, and maybe lobby as concerned citizens about light pollution in Cork? Uh, the answer to the question, Paul, is that uh, the, the club committee has actually just recently uh, become alert to the fact that we haven't done anything in this area and it behoves us to do so. Okay, great. And we intend to do precisely what you just outlined. Fantastic. We haven't actually done it yet, but we have that intention. Now, I, I know there are others, not Lee Stanley, who want to ask a question, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to call a halt to the questioning at this point. Uh, but in a few minutes' time, in about five minutes' time, in fact, maybe less, I, I, I shall be closing uh, the meeting and invite you down to tea here and biscuits over there. And Thomas, Thomas will be here and he'll be drinking tea and you'll be able to ask him the question that you either didn't have the time uh, um, to ask during the formal session or maybe you didn't have the inclination. But now, the next thing I want to do is I want to thank Thomas on your behalf. Um, Thomas, you gave us an impressive lecture and we're delighted that you came to Vienna to, um, uh, to do that. And we very much hope that you enjoyed your trip to Burr. I do, I did. Yes. Yesterday, yes. to see what used to be once the biggest telescope in the world. And with that in mind, I have a little book here, which, on behalf of Cork Astronomy Club, I would like to present you with oh. as a memento of your visit to Cork and your visit to Burr. It's William Parsons, the Earl of Ross, Astronomy and the Castle in 17th Century Ireland. I'm, I'm struggling because I've got my specs on. <laughs> Let me get my specs. Now, I'll start again. <laughs> Astronomy and the Castle in 19th Century Ireland, edited by Charles Boland. It, that, and, and it's got a picture of the Burr telescope on the front. Thomas, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. So, Thomas, thanks for coming. For Thank Vienna, you to have for coming, and I'm really delighted uh, to have been invited here. Thank you.